I'm going to read to you my blurb because it's really good. <laughs> this is my blurb for Mitch's book, The, Mir the Miracle Club. Mitch Horowitz embodies the best and a seeker, and we're about seeking here. A critical eye, an empathetic heart, and an integrity that is ref refreshing for an age that has been duped too often by too many self-proclaimed finders. Mitch is a contemporary Diogenes without the cynicism, a Socrates minus the coyness, a Kierkegaard with a happier spirit, spirit, and every man's philosopher who roams freely among the world's great ideas, especially those that have been forgotten, hidden, or otherwise dismissed. The world needs his voice and insights now more than ever. Because the world needs his voice and ours, I'm happy to announce tonight that through a unanimous decision by the Board of Directors of the University of Philosophical Research, Mitch Horowitz is now lecturer in residence at the University of Philosophical Research. What does this mean? It means that we like him. It means that he likes us because he agreed. What it really means, he lives in New York, so in residence is in quotation marks, but we're an online school, so we can make that work. Uh, we're gonna have Mitch here twice a year um, for events like these, and we're gonna work him really hard when he's here. Uh, he, he has, I think, five events just with us yeah. while you're here. And then, of course, people flock. They wanna interview him while he's here. Um, and then he also, this is one of his greatest contributions to us and for us is his work, his editorial work. So many of you will know the secret teachings of all ages, Manley Hall's signature work. I bet many, if not most of you, have the reader's edition, which is a, you know, one that you can actually hold as opposed to the <laughs> big book. That was Mitch. He made that happen at Penguin for us, and it, we, it's still a great seller, right? Yeah, so Mitch is, uh, is really helping us with publications, and in fact, uh, we've got a new work, a new Manly Palmer Hall work coming out. When is that coming out? Next July year? 4th. July 4th, with St. Martin's Press, called The Secret History of America, edited by Mitch Horowitz. Now, yeah. This includes material that's not been published before. Uh, it's, it's been called, Mitch called it from the journals, uh, the PRS journals that, um, you know, they're just in the library. Uh, but he went through them and pulled out the relevant sections and, and edited it for us. And, and then there's, there's portions from The Secret Destiny of America, right? And we're gonna keep doing things like that because Mitch, among his other gifts is a brilliant writer and editor and has worked in the publishing industry. Finally, Mitch is a unique person. I've never met someone, truly, I've met a lot of people who moves through the world like Mitch does. He's a happy warrior for the right to follow your bliss, a sharp critic for those who would deny that right to others, and a genuinely good guy in a world full of bad guys, posers and power brokers. He's none of those things. We like him, I think you will too. Mitch Horowitz. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Oh look, someone played a trick on me. I see. Hi, live streamers. We're glad to have you out there in the matrix. Welcome. Um, wonderful to be here. I'm always so happy to be in Los Angeles and especially at UPR, which is really, I wouldn't even call it a, a second home to me. I, I feel very much like this is home. And 
I'm so glad to see you all, and you'll be seeing a lot more of me, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Greg mentioned, he's doing double duty because in addition to running this facility, he's serving jury duty this week. And I told him over text that I have no idea how Greg gets selected for a jury. You're asked, what's your occupation? And he has to say, well, I preside over a wisdom academy in the tradition of Pythagoras's mystery school. <laughs> and they're like, you're in. Great. So I can't even, he's not allowed to talk about it, but I can't even fathom, you know, what the case is. Um, and I also would like to be invited to teach at the children's camp in July because I'm so good with my own children. I have two boys, two adolescent boys, who punch me in the stomach and tell me I'm not a real socialist <laughs> and who challenge me on whether there's clinical evidence for ESP, which is something you should never challenge me on. That's the only transgressive thing you can ever say to me if you suggest there's not lab evidence for ESP. Don't go there. <laughs> no, I'll give another talk here on that topic. But tonight, of course, we are dealing with the founder and the individual who established this facility, the great and unusual and mysterious Manly P. Hall who died in 1990 and who for many decades beginning, well beginning really in the earliest stages in 1934, but then occupying this podium and this stage and this chair since 1959 when this building was erected. PRS, this wonderful campus, was built over the course of several decades and it was built by a man who had no formal education, who had no presence within American academia, who was born in a, what was then a very rural city in Canada, in the province of Ontario, in Peterborough, in the year 1901, whose parents divorced shortly before he was born and he was raised by his maternal grandmother in South Dakota, and they bopped around the American West, sometimes making visits to Chicago, sometimes New York, sometimes Philadelphia, to go to museums. He had virtually no formal schooling whatsoever. And in the year 1928, when he was all of 27 years old, he published this epic volume, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, that stands up today as a codex of esoteric, mythical, and occult ideas that have populated the human intellect for centuries upon centuries. The book has chapters on Pythagorean mathematics, Egyptian architecture, Hellenic mystery schools, the esotericism of the Shakespearean dramas, the uses of ciphers and secret codes, Native American mythology, the earliest beginnings of the Mayan empire, and this scratches just the merest surface of what exists within this tabletop sized book and doesn't even touch upon the unusual and magnificent visuals and the complexity of page design to accommodate all kinds of ideas, symbols, ciphers, a page of the original secret teachings of all ages can look as complex to the eye as a page of Babylonian Talmud. And of course, Manley did this without any of the accoutrements of modern technology and record keeping that we have today, relying solely upon his own resources in tracking down unusual and unknown books availing himself of the resources of early libraries that had opened to public use, including the New York Public Library, where he began the secret teachings of all ages, the British Library, where he continued his work. Benefactors here in Los Angeles gave him money so that he could travel throughout various parts of Asia, India, Japan, Egypt. He went to auction houses, he collected manuscripts, and he dedicated himself to this laborious 
work producing probably the most significant underground book ever written underground because he published it and oversaw every facet of its assemblage entirely himself. All of this with hardly a stitch of what we would call formal education accomplished at the age of 27. It brought him a certain degree of underground fame which allowed him to attract benefactors, particularly in industries like oil and railroads. Hollywood hadn't even kicked into high gear yet, nothing like what was known a generation later. But there was oil money out here, railroad money here in Southern California. There was one family that gave him the deed to a single oil well, so he was able to reap the profits of that. And he used this money to build this institution that we're in today, to build the library. And he spent the rest of his life here, never seeking much in the way of praise or adulation, didn't really hobnob very much with the, oh, I don't know, how would you put it, the Hollywood jet set. You know who his friends were? Burl Ives, who did the voice of Frosty the Snowman, that master of the black arts, and <clears throat> Bella Lugosi, later in Bella's career, Boris Karloff, Elvis Presley was an admirer of Hall's, they never met. I will talk about a political figure he was friends with a little bit later tonight. But he wasn't somebody who went looking for glory or social ladders among actors or Hollywood producers. He wasn't somebody whose name appeared very often in any newspapers or mainstream media. He didn't really go chasing after attention, but he was known for this methodical way of working where every Sunday for years and years and years at 11 a.m. he would enter the auditorium from his office he would sit in this magisterial, enormous chair, which he would fill. He was a very large framed man. Deliver a discourse, sometimes for an hour and a half, sometimes for two hours, without a single note or index card in his hand, without so much as an um or an uh or a you know. And after delivering just an impeccable discourse, he would simply get up in his older years using a walking stick, exit the door, and somebody would drive him back to his house in Hollywood Hills. He was a worker. He was a meticulous worker. And as such, he became a figure of mystery to people. His lack of inclination to seek public attention and the excellence that he brought to his work at so young an age made him a source of mystery. But I also believe, and it's very important to hear this, I also believe that it became a lifelong burden to him that he peaked when he was very, very young. It's very difficult to produce your magnum opus at the age of 27. He lived until the age of 89. And then you're in a situation where how many more mountains can you possibly climb? People have these expectations of you. You develop expectations of yourself. And I think it can be as much a burden as a source of wonder or cause for admiration that he was able to produce the work he did at so young an age. It's a privilege for me to be able to talk about Manly P. Hall from the very podium, the very auditorium that he built, because as much as I love and admire this man, who I never met, and as much as he gave me a sense of life direction, it's deeply important 
and I think he would have been the first to say this, that we also not engage in a kind of hero worship. Our culture is going through this spasm of immaturity right now, where people are engaged everywhere in this passionately intensified form of binary thinking. And that is the death grip to the esoteric search, the absolute death grip. What's so profoundly important is that we sustain and keep deepening and deepening the questions that we as individuals hold. The last thing we need to do is to create a new dogma or doctrine or catechism or church to anything or to anyone. And I'm certain, above all things, that Manley would not have wanted that. So when I speak of him at times critically, I speak of him critically because I love him as one adult loves another, not as a child loves his or her favorite cartoon character, and you can't say anything bad about My Little Pony or you have to be put to death, which is frankly the dominant attitude within human nature. It's the dominant flaw within human nature. So I want to speak about Manly as one would speak about an adult. Now, I first heard the name Manly P. Hall about 20 years ago. I was more or less at the beginning of my own search into esoteric subject matter, and I was having lunch with two friends who were more steeped in this material than I was, and I said to them, who do you think I should be reading? And one of them said, in this kind of beautiful, husky voice, Manly P. Hall. And her name actually was Pythia, which was the name given to the prophet at the oracle at Delphi. And as Manly writes about this figure in the secret teachings of all ages, Pythia or Pythonus was a name that was given to someone who went into these transcendent states of ecstasy and grew intoxicated upon inhaling the gaseous fumes of decomposing matter and then was able to transform herself into a kind of oracle or seer. So it was interesting that somebody with the name Pythia was first exposing me to Manly P. Hall and when she said the name and when she uttered the words, the secret teachings of all ages, everything within me said, yes, I had to know who this person was. And when I read the secret teachings of all ages and I procured a copy immediately, it was not only the content that was so arousing to me, but Manly P. Hall gave me my first sense that the study of esoteric history could be a vocation in itself, in the fullest sense. The depths of seriousness, the comprehensiveness, the quality that he brought to his work ignited me with this idea that this in itself could be a life path. And so immediately I became interested, as many people do, in who this man was and how he was able to accomplish what he did at so young an age. Now, of course, there was all this mythology that surrounded uh, Manly when he was alive and shortly after his death. People talked about him as being a reincarnate of Plato. Um, people speculated about whether he had a photographic memory, if there is such a thing really, which is what allowed him to compile and imbibe and digest so much information. People talked about him accumulating wisdom from other lifetimes. So there was a kind of a cult mythology that developed around Manly. There was a story that when he was born, his, his heart had stopped beating and he was revived by the attending physician. And in that interim period, Manly died and was reoccupied 
either by the spirit of Plato or some Hellenic philosopher. These were the various mythologies that developed around the man. I don't think he ever encouraged any of these things, but again, there was this feeling among his students and among people who came in touch with him that there was something beyond the ordinary about this man. There was something beyond the ordinary, and I think that's true. I think that's true. I've read The Secret Teachings very, very carefully, and when I prepared the reader's edition of The Secret Teachings, my dedication was to create a text that you could read and to create it without abridgment, without cutting anything. Some of the images I did cut uh, from the reader's edition out of necessity, but none, none that were intrinsic to the understanding of the text. And I'll never forget that I had the full text of the original secret teachings recreated and reset into a manuscript, okay? And when it arrived at my desk, it stood about one foot tall. And I read the whole thing, and I was deeply struck, not only at the quality and the breadth and the expansiveness of what was contained in the book, but also the readability of it. It really isn't a dreary or difficult read. It's really a book that lends itself to your falling into it. So among all of its other traits and attributes, it's a very sprightly, readerly text, and it only deepened the mystery for me. It only deepened the mystery for me. There are other monumental books that are very difficult to read. Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine is very difficult to read. It can be read. Uh, Gurdjieff's Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson is purposely, purposefully difficult to read. It can be read. It can be read. But Manley Hall's book, it just flows smoothly. And at the time, um, the philosopher Jacob Needleman, I was telling him about this, and he said to me, well, you may now be among the one and a half people in this country who have read all of the secret teachings of all ages. Because it had this reputation as a book that nobody but a wingnut could approach and fully read. But it can be fully read. And when I had this manuscript laid out in front of me, the fact that it, it was so beautifully readable in that form alone only deepened its mystery for me. So who was this man? Who was this man? Are the romantics correct? You know, he was a reincarnate of somebody? He was somehow a living avatar or vessel of accumulated wisdom? Are they, are they right? Because he wasn't ordinary. I'll do my best. I'll do my best at describing who I think he was, admitting that I don't think that the mystery will ever be fully in focus, nor should it be. This was someone who led a profoundly lonely existence as a child. And he was born just at the end of the Victorian era, a time when people did not disclose personal details of their lives very easily. And I think probably most of us are defined by whatever era is the immediate antecedent to our birth. And he was born in a rural province in a commonwealth of Great Britain at the end of the Victorian age. And it was not an age where people disclosed many details. But there was an emotional brutality to his youth that's not always easy for us to understand in the 21st century. His parents did uh, divorce, as I alluded earlier, before he was born. And his father disappeared. He kind of fled the scene. His mother was a very unusual woman. She was kind of a bohemian. I was telling some of the folks who were visiting from Atlas Obscura earlier today that there's one photograph that I know of her where she's in kind of Victorian garb, but she wears her hair very long and straight, and she looked like Grace Slick from Jefferson Airplane back in the day. Very unusual appearance for a woman in 1900. 
long, straight hair. She was posing with a violin, and she wore a wristwatch, which also very, very unusual for a woman. For a woman. She was a chiropractor, probably one of the first female chiropractors in North America. And she wanted to practice as a chiropractor, to live freely. She was a musician. She was a seeker. And she moved to California very shortly after Manley's birth. And it, there was obviously some sort of very deep fissure within the family, some very deep family breakup, which Manley never wrote or spoke explicitly of. And he was raised by his maternal grandmother. And she was American. And she brought Manley up in South Dakota and in other parts of the American West. Very, very rural environs. She was a fairly well-off woman. Her husband was a successful executive in the fire insurance business, um, although he had died by this time. And she was left enough money so that she didn't have to work. And she basically traveled with Manley around the American West. She did not enroll him in school. She would take him on trips from time to time to museums and hotels in Chicago, Boston, New York, Philadelphia. And he really had virtually no friends. He wasn't around other kids. He spent most of his time around adults. What very, very few memories of childhood he was willing to disclose were usually encounters with other adults. For example, there was a, at a hotel that they stayed at in Chicago, there was a, a Hindu maitre d' who he became friendly with. And he taught manly adult table manners, and he taught him how to assemble the correct utensils and so on. This was some uh, man who had obviously been raised within some sort of a British uh, household or system of, of, of preparatory school. And these are the memories that he disclosed. You know, his, he, the, there were virtually no children in his life. And it wasn't until he was about 15 years old that his grandmother, Florence, uh, decided to enroll Manley at a military academy in New York City, where he spent maybe about two years, and he probably felt very blessed and lucky that his tenure there was brief, because I can't imagine how a 15-year-old kid raised by his grandmother bopping around the American West could have dealt with and gotten along with other adolescent boys at a military school in New York City, of all places, uh, having not been exposed to other kids for most of his childhood. If you go to the bookstore after our talk tonight, you'll see there's a photograph of Manley with his grandmother, Florence, and it's during his military academy days, and he's wearing this kind of drum major outfit. He has a ceremonial sword, and I'm sure he was grateful this was a fairly brief part of his life. His grandmother died right around that time, and Manley moved out here to Southern California to be closer to his mother. And almost immediately upon arriving here, he fell in with different occult groups, self-styled Rosicrucian groups, and different organizations. And he began to study and immerse himself very deeply into occult and esoteric philosophies. He began a speaking career at the age of 19, in 1920 in Santa Monica, where in a little rented space above a bank building, he gave a talk on reincarnation, for which he earned 35 cents. And apparently, the talk he delivered was compelling, because people kept coming back. And his popularity as this kind of boy wonder of esoteric wisdom began to build, and it began to grow. And he became a minister at a liberal evangelical church called the Church of the People, which under his early leadership eventually became a kind of radically ecumenical, very liberal metaphysical church. And in 1922, there was a profile of this ministerial boy wonder in the Los Angeles Times. And the reporter almost seemed to express this kind of crush or infatuation over him. She wrote, 
you know, he is tall and he has broad shoulders, a football player's shoulders, and he wears his hair long like a girl. He's very masculine, but his eyes convey an almost feminine expression. And, you know, it was kind of funny reading this because obviously the reporter was sort of falling in love with him. And um, he was very physically impressive. He had movie star good looks. He was very solidly built. He was very tall. He was apparently beautifully articulate. There was an idealism about him. Obviously, we don't have recordings of any of his talks from these times, but he would talk about how modern materialism was turning men into criminals and how our hard lunch counters and whistles and lunch pails and regimented way of life was deteriorating man's life and that this is what was responsible for juvenile delinquency and this is what was responsible for dope fiends and all the bad guys out there. And he espoused this very kind of progressive occult philosophy that if we could get back in touch with the underground stream of esoteric wisdom, we could create better men and women. And I think probably what was going on in Manley's life was that after a childhood and adolescence of profound loneliness and isolation, but also independent learning that had been fostered by his grandmother, a kind of very unconventional, free-flowing, self-directed form of education, finally, finally, the isolation seemed to be at an end. And yes, he did have broad shoulders and good looks and long hair and a feminine expression and he, he was a physically compelling presence. And he was earnestly dedicated to occult ideas that he was discovering through some of the various Rosicrucian and Freemasonic and, and theosophical societies and offshoots that were sprouting up around Southern California. And he was answering a call in the culture. He was answering a call in the culture. The great teachers at that time were either in Europe or they had passed away. And there was this momentary gap into which he strode like a giant, like a giant. And he attracted benefactors. And as I alluded earlier, he was able to start traveling to Japan, to India, to Egypt. And here's what's strange. Some of Manley's letters from his travels were published. And the truth is, I've read them. I invite you to do the same. There is an ordinariness to them. There's a conventional quality to them. There's nothing in these letters from his Eastern travels that seems to foreshadow or prophesize the greatness that he would later, and really within a very few years later, express within the secret teachings of all ages. You read these letters, and they're almost very ordinary, linear, Edwardian travelogues. We got up, we went here, we had breakfast here, I bought a statue. There's nothing remarkable about them. And yet, and yet then, very soon thereafter, something remarkable happens. Manley publishes a little book in 1922 called Initiates of the Flame, which some of you might know, and reproductions of it are, are available in the bookstore. And in, in writing Initiates of the Flame in 1922, when he was all of about 21 years old, he summarizes in capsule form everything that would later be found in the secret teachings of all ages. And he collaborates with the artist uh, J. Augustus Knapp, who became the illustrator of the secret teachings of all ages. Knapp's work is controversial. Some people think it's this technicolored, disnified version of the occult. Others love it. I mean, it, 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 it kind of pulls at my childhood imagination. And I, I love Knapp's work. And I'm a big fan and admirer of Knapp. So the, these two guys collaborate on this very, very short book. You can read it in a single sitting. And it contains within it Manley's contention 
that there is this ancient esoteric philosophy that kind of runs like a secret underground river through all of our religions, but it's been forgotten and it's been layered over with all this dogma and doctrine and it's, it was preserved within certain secret societies, particularly Freemasonry and some of the various occult fraternities. And it rests upon the capacity of the individual through self-search to discover his or her own divine cosmic nature and to attain refinement, which can continue in these concentric circles. There's this limitless possibility open to the searching man and woman. And it's, this possibility is encrypted in symbols, in codes, in ciphers, in ceremonies that have been preserved within some of the Masonic orders and some of the other esoteric groups. And that modern people in this age of materialism have to reclaim it. Initiates of the Flame was the kernel of everything that later sprouted in the secret teachings of all ages. And not many years later, this was 1922, Secret Teachings was published in 1928. What happened? What happened? How did he go from being this promising, appealing, attractive, compelling speaker who was not always enthralling? I've said that you know, his letters from the East to my eyes, didn't contain anything much other than linear travelogue details. But suddenly he gives birth, and it was sudden, to Initiates of the Flame, which serves as the foundational work, the springboard to secret teachings of all ages. A work that was just so vast and so epic and so large in its breadth and scope. I've sat at the oak tables at the New York Public Library where Manley began writing the secret teachings of all ages. I've walked the hallways that he walked. I've held and caressed the books that populate his bibliography. I've poured over his bibliography. I've done the forensics that one can do. And yet still it's a mystery. Still it's a mystery. What gave him this out of the ordinary ability. I can't come to any definitive answer. I can't come to any definitive answer. But I feel certain that part of the answer, part of the answer had to do with this aching loneliness that he knew as a kid and an adolescent and a teen. The nurturing of independent education that his grandmother brought to him, his boundless passion and enthusiasm that he discovered and that was tapped by this esoteric material that he happened upon, and his capacity to dedicate himself absolutely without distraction to the amassing and codifying of details of esoteric history as they were available to him at that time. Now, as great a book as The Secret Teachings is, it's not uniformly even in its quality. Some chapters stand up extraordinarily well. In particular, I think, his chapter on Pythagorean mathematics is excellent. His material on the inner meaning and the cosmic dimensions of Egyptian and Hellenic architecture is excellent. His theories on the esotericism of the Shakespearean dramas are unusual, they're unconventional, they're compelling. I can't speak to their historical uh, validity, but there's much there that's excellent. His, his material on the psychological and materialist meaning and operations of alchemy is excellent. I'm less taken with his material 
on tarot because I think he bought into a, a kind of modern mythology around tarot that was erected by Eliphas Levy and writers that followed him. And I think sometimes Manley was too quick to accept uncritically some of Levy's uh, theories and some of the theories that followed on from that. Um, Manley has a chapter on Muhammad that probably wouldn't be considered uh, very valid or polished by today's circumstances, uh, by, by today's uh, scholarship. He has a um, chapter on the inner meaning of the pyramids and the purpose of the pyramids, um, which is bereft of sourcing material. A lot of it is him, I think, repeating things that he heard at Theosophical and Rosicrucian Lodge meetings. So as deeply as I venerate this book and as deeply as I love this book, I can't stand here and say that every aspect of it is of uniform quality. It's not. So I think it's, it's important, at least in my estimation, to temper our sense of mystery at who he was by realizing that not every aspect of his work was a perfectly sculpted diamond. He was a person. He was a person. And even in a work as great as The Secret Teachings of All Ages and this prefigured works of Manley's that were later to come, there is unevenness. And that unevenness would be felt in other works and other talks in future decades in his life. I say this because, again, there is a tendency to mythologize. And mythologizing can deepen the meaning of a person. And mythologizing can be more important from an ethical perspective and a learning perspective than ordinary historicism. But mythologizing can also turn into dogma, can also turn into dogma. And I can assure you there were very uneven moments in certain of Manley's statements and scholarship. And it's important to say that because I've encountered and you've encountered and it's just part of human nature that this is the this is part of what happens on the highway of the of the of the search and of the human exchange. One encounters people in situations where if you say the least thing to detract from the esteem in which a person or a work is held, you're viewed as if you've gone all the way across this sliding scale to where you're vilifying them. And that's how we wind up not having vivid, complete, and full pictures of our heroes and heroines. And I want to have as vivid and as complete and as full a picture of Manly P. Hall. Now, I said that I thought he was blessed and cursed by peaking young. He published The Secret Teachings of All Ages, self-published it through selling early subscriptions to the book. I think his first printing was about 2,000 copies at the age of 27. And it is absolutely astounding, absolutely astounding. But what do you do at the age of 28? It's challenging. It's challenging. Still very young. Well, what did he do at the age of 28, 29, 30? He had succeeded in issuing The Secret Teachings of All Ages, this enormous table-sized book in a beautiful slipcase. He pre-sold thousands of copies in order to facilitate uh, the cost of publishing the book. He attracted, although he was an underground figure, he attracted a lot of remarkable fans, got a lot of attention. General John Pershing, who, who led US forces in World War I, signed the guest book 
at a reception that was held for Manly in New York City by the king, the crown prince of Sweden. Just another book party, you know. Um, so it's kind of impressive that the crown prince of Sweden hasn't been returning my emails, but he held a book party for Manly, and General John Pershing was there, and people from industry and other walks of life were there. And, you know, so he did attract a certain degree of attention, although not within academia. And what would chapter two be? What would chapter two be? That was the question that Manley faced. Now, he did engage in some very good publishing and writing immediately following the publication of The Secret Teachings. He produced one volume uh, of a projected series of journals called The Phoenix. Some of you might know The Phoenix. It came out in one volume, a limited edition hardcover journal. You can purchase reproductions of it in the bookstore. It's very good. It was the first and the last of a projected series of journals. It's outstanding. The illustrations are quite beautiful. There are extensive articles on Madam H.P. Blavatsky, who Manley venerated, uh, Albert Pike, a formative uh, Freemason, who Manley venerated, other very interesting articles and features, beautiful illustrations. You might be able to take a look at an original first edition if you make an appointment at the library, and it's well worth looking at. So he was going to publish this journal called The Phoenix, but only one issue came out. And it is lavish, and it is beautiful, and the quality is very high. He began another journal, a magazine called The All-Seeing Eye. He wrote most of the pieces in there. Uh, the early editions are very high quality, very physically beautiful, some very, very fine articles. And he began to raise money to build this place that we're seated in, the Philosophical Research Society, whose first building was erected in 1934. So he was engaged very actively in a variety of publishing pursuits, independent scholarly pursuits. And in a certain sense, in a certain sense, Manley hit another peak uh, during the late days of the Second World War. He gave a talk at Carnegie Hall in New York City called The Secret Destiny of America, which he published in book form in 1944. It was in the late days of World War II, and it seemed evident that the US and the Allies were going to prevail. And it struck Manley, as it did other people, that the remainder of the century was going to be the American century. And he codified these ideas into this book, The Secret Destiny of America, which he published in 1944. He published another book several years following in 1951 called America's Assignment with Destiny, which I think is the better of the two books. But the, the Secret Destiny of America became a central title in Manley's oeuvre. And I would say this, and I want to say this very, very carefully. It's the best and worst of Manley Hall. It's the best and worst of Manley Hall. There are chapters and ideas in The Secret Destiny of America and in America's Assignment with Destiny that stand up with great historical validity. And I'm going to be very specific about that in just a moment. There are also ideas that are almost examples of Manly willingly repeating and regurgitating certain folklore and occultic ideas without fully making the effort, I think, to determine whether they have historical verity. And in this, we find some of Manley's greatest failures, I think, and some of his greatest and most epic forms of influence. Because one of these 
pieces of folklore that Manley wrote about in The Secret Destiny of America captured the imagination of a middling Hollywood actor who later went on to a rather influential political career, and his name was Ronald Reagan. And I've written about this extensively in mainstream places and in every variety of place. Manley wrote in The Secret Destiny of America that at the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the various uh, delegates at the Philadelphia State House were wavering and were worried about signing their name to this radical document. And that by signing their name with this document, they were formally breaking with the British Empire, breaking with the crown, and that there would undoubtedly be a war, and if the crown prevailed, everybody who put his name on this document would be rounded up, arrested, and executed. And so they were wavering as to whether to add their signature. So Manley writes that from the back of the room, there arose this mysterious figure, this unknown speaker, this old man, who stood up and made this rousing speech telling the wavering delegates that if they would sign their names on this, onto this document, not only would they be safe, would they be protected, but they would be striking a chord, striking an octave for revolution and human liberty that would one day reverberate all around the world. And it was their life's destiny to shepherd this document into existence. And the men in the room were so aroused by this morale-building speech from this mysterious unknown figure that they rushed forward to sign their name to the document. And then when they were all done, they looked around to congratulate the man who had encouraged them. And he was gone. He had disappeared, even though all the doors in the state house were guarded by vigilant sentries. No one could find the mysterious speaker. Who was he? And Manley wondered, was he a master of wisdom of one of the ancient mystery schools sent to encourage the flagging spirits of the delegates to the Philly State House? No one knows. No one knows to this day who he was or how he entered or left. So that's that. And <laughs> after I published my first book, Occult America, I was doing a radio show with um, a host in New Orleans. And after the show was over, we were chatting. And he said to me, hey, did you know that Ronald Reagan believes in the existence of these you know, hidden masters like Madame Blavatsky used to talk about, these hidden adepts? And I said, no, I didn't know that. What makes you think Ronald Reagan believed that? And he said, well, I'm going to send you an article. So he sends me an article, which is a reprint of a piece that Reagan wrote for Parade Magazine on July 4th of 1981, very early in his presidency, entitled, What the Fourth of July Means to Me. And it was a piece that, according to Reagan's aide, Michael Deaver, Reagan had written in longhand on a yellow legal pad at Camp David, Parade Magazine had asked him to write a short essay on uh, what the 4th of July means to me. He complied, uh, wrote it out in longhand, gave it to somebody else to be typed up. It was sent off to Parade Magazine. So he sends me this piece, and I'm reading this, and I'm like, here's Reagan retelling that exact story using some of the same idiom and phraseology that Manley Hall used. And I'm saying to myself, OK, there's something very strange going on here. And I think, well, the first question you have to ask is, maybe this story has been told 100 different times in 100 different places. So where did Reagan get it from? So I begin to research it. I begin to research it. And I find that, yes, there have been different versions of this story. But Reagan, in certain places in his essay in Parade Magazine, uses 
precise phraseology and idiom that Manley Hall used. And it's absolutely unmistakable. And I'm going back through all the different sources, and there's all these different versions of the story. In some versions, it's Patrick Henry. In some versions, it's uh, John Hancock. There, there's all kinds of different, you know, in the same way that urban legends take on diffuse tellings over time, there's all these different tellings. But I go back and back and back and back and I find that the earliest version of it was in a book called Legends of the Revolution, published in 1854 by an American muckraker and reformer named George Lippert, who was friends with Edgar Allan Poe and who had a real taste himself for the Gothic. The earliest version on record that I have been able to determine of the unknown speaker, the mysterious speaker, was in George Lippert's account in Legends of the Revolution. And he has the speaker in a mysterious cloak and nobody knows who he is and so on. And Lippert basically acknowledges that the story is invented. But he said it does capture some of the dramatic fervor and oration of the time. He basically says this. Manley, in his account, which he tells in shorter version in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and he told in a couple of other places, seemed to have no awareness whatsoever of the original incarnation of the story. All he said is that the story had been copied and given to him by a secretary from the Theosophical Society who said it was from some hidden book of American oration that was not known to hardly more than uh, a, a tiny handful of Americans. Other than that, he gave no bibliographical material or reference for the story. Now, that's not great historicism. One should say, okay, thank you, secretary from the Theosophical Society, but where, where is this story from? What is this ancient book? It's not obvious to me, and Manley never indicated, that he asked or pursued that question. But the story with that explanation does appear in The Secret Destiny of America. And the language in which Manley told the story in The Secret Destiny of America appears indelibly, not only in Reagan's essay from 1981, but I turn the clock back and I find that Reagan had been telling that same story using Manley's language and phraseology to the earliest political speeches he gave starting in the 1950s when he was a spokesman for GE. He told this story throughout his career, including well into his presidency, in a speech that he gave to millions of people on television for the centenary celebration around the Statue of Liberty, for those who remember that. Here is one of the most influential presidents of the 20th century repeating a story, in some cases line and verse, out of Manley Hall's Secret Destiny of America. And so I asked myself, okay, these guys lived in Los Angeles. Reagan had always had occult interests. I write about this a lot in my book, One Simple Idea. Reagan was friends with a lot of occult figures, including some figures that you all may know. Eden Gray, a writer who wrote some of the first popular tarot guides. She and Reagan were pals. Jean Dixon, the psychic, she and Reagan were pals. There was a man named Carol Ryder, who was an astrologer, very popular, who lived in Santa Monica. He was on the cover of Time magazine in 1969, the one and only time that that magazine has featured an astrologer on the cover. He identifies Carol Ryder as his best friend in his memoir, Where's the Rest of Me, which he wrote in 1965. People talk of a secret history, you know, this stuff is all hidden, how do you know this? It's like, well, I know it because Ronald Reagan called Carol Ryder his best friend in his memoir, and he was an astrologer. So Reagan, Ron and Nancy Reagan were bopping around with occult figures for decades. They were Southern Californians. Who were they supposed to be friends with, you know? And so they would have had no friends. And it was funny. Um, Reagan and Ron, Ronald and, and Nancy Reagan were friends with the actor William Holden, and uh, very close. And Lucille Ball, in one of her memoirs, writes that one night in the 1950s, William Holden was having a dinner party at uh, 
at his house, and Ron and Nancy show up late, and they're all excited, and they're all out of breath, and everybody's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And they say, we saw a flying saucer, and we chased it down the Pacific Highway. We were driving, and you know, and they were sort of hysterical with glee over seeing this flying saucer. And you know, she thought they were both nuts, but <laughs> the fact is, you know, everyone was scandalized when it came out that Nancy was consulting an astrologer, a woman named Joan Quigley, who died several years ago, who lived in San Francisco, to set Reagan's uh, um, schedule and, 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 uh, and calendar of events in the second half of his presidency. This had been going on for decades. So it's not that unusual in, in, in context that Reagan would have found his way to this book. But I did wonder, I did wonder whether or not Reagan and Manley ever met, considering both men spent most of their adult life here in the same city. And Manley was known in Los Angeles, especially to people like Ronald Reagan, who took an interest in these things. So I found that Reagan gave a uh, speech to CPAC, uh, the Conservative Political Action Committee, in 1974. And I found a transcript of the speech, and there he is again telling the story of the unknown speaker at the Declaration of Independence. And Reagan said, I don't know exactly where this story originally comes from, and I have to confess, I never made an attempt to verify it. Some people said that the unknown speaker was Thomas Jefferson, uh, but I never really made an attempt to verify it but the story was told to me by a scholar who was very steeped in this kind of history. And that was the closest I could get until uh, I was told a story which was repeated to me in an interview which I write about in our forthcoming anthology, The Secret History of America. I was told a story by a great scholar, great friend of PRS, Dr. Stefan Heller, who many of you know and have heard speak from this podium. And Stefan was deeply involved with PRS in the early 1970s and is again today, of course, which is wonderful. And Stefan told me a story in an interview that I did with him several months ago, which I write about in this new introduction you guys are getting sort of an advanced preview of this, that he was here one day to give a class in the early 70s, 71, 72, on campus. This was early in Reagan's second term as governor. And when he came onto campus, he saw in the parking lot a stretch limousine and a chauffeur dressed in a formal uniform kind of hanging out outside the limousine, leaning against the car, and having a smoke. And Stefan said, uh, tell me, um, who is the owner of this beautiful car? And uh, at first the driver didn't want to say anything, and Stefan continued to ask him, come on, you know, who's the, who's the guy behind this beautiful automobile? And the driver said to him, it's Governor Reagan. He's in there meeting with uh, Manley Hall. And Stefan was rather struck by this. And he later said to the librarian at the time, whose name was Pearl Thomas, that this driver told him that, uh, that Mr. Hall was meeting with the governor. And according to Stefan, Pearl said to him, oh yes, oh yes, they are acquainted and we do get calls from him sometimes. And that later, when Reagan began to rise nationally and became a serious presidential candidate, uh, when his name came up in conversation, he said that Manley Hall would kind of chuckle and say, oh yes, oh yes, we know him, yes. So for any of you who know Stefan Heller, you know he's a tremendously uh, demure, serious, man prone and given to no exaggeration, has never spoken about this uh, topic before, is not somebody who uh, is in any way drawn or attracted to uh, lurid stories or flights of imagination. And 
he told it to me in the mildest and most straightforward of tones. And from everything that I can possibly gather from the circumstances that I laid out to you, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Manley Hall and Ronald Reagan sat together and knew one another and were acquainted. And Reagan, from very early in his career as a politician, was influenced by material in the secret destiny of America. Now, one could say, oh, God, this gives me a headache. You know, this fanciful story influences Reagan. And this is the guy in whose hands we sat for eight years. You know, well, first of all, the answer is yes. So, so if you're worried, yes, you should be worried. No, I'm, that's really not the point of my story. Uh, what, the point of my story really is this, and that is that in conveying that myth, which I think he should have done more, Manley should have done more to try to verify historically, but in conveying that myth, he was conveying something that had a broader truth, and I want to be very, very clear about this, and I write about this very carefully in the introduction to the forthcoming book, The Secret History of America, and it's very, very important to bring this out because I think it, it helps bring greater focus to what Reagan was responding to in the story, to what Manley was promulgating in his books, Secret Destiny of America, which I think was really in terms of influence was his great chapter two, following Secret Teachings of All Ages. And there was something historically true and valid and correct and misunderstood that runs throughout Manley's writings on America, and it is this. Manley had what might be called a secret society thesis. And the secret society thesis was that certain ideas of individual liberty and the extolling of the individual search and the belief in a kind of radical self-destiny had occupied the moral imaginations of esoteric philosophers for hundreds and hundreds of years. And these revolutionary ideas very often had to go underground and be encrypted in symbols, in dramas, in passion plays, in myth, in parable, and in the rites and rituals of esoteric orders, particularly Freemasonry. And it is an absolute fact that an inordinate number of America's founders were Freemasons. This is not fantasy. This includes George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, John Hancock, a largely disproportionate number of Washington's generals, a largely disproportionate number of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a largely disproportionate number of the framers of the Constitution. This is a fact. America, in its colonial days, was seen in Europe as kind of a safe harbor for people with radical religious beliefs. It wasn't just the pilgrims, people who were fleeing the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War in Central Europe, people who were fleeing accusations of witchcraft and religious persecution in England, in Switzerland, in various parts of Western Europe, those who had the means and the capacity and the willingness to make a very, very dangerous journey across the Atlantic did, in fact, come to the colonies, helped to populate the early city of Philadelphia, helped to populate some of the New England states, came to New York, came to Virginia, came to Boston, because the colonies were known from very, very early on as being a safe place where you could function if you had heretical religious beliefs. William Penn, the founder of the city of Philadelphia, had been a Quaker. He experienced discrimination at Oxford, and he founded Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, with the ideal that this is a place where people of different religious backgrounds could function. 
And although the ideal did fall short at times of the reality, basically Philly was a place for many decades in the 1600s into the 1700s before the Declaration, before the Constitution, that attracted a wide variety of mystical figures from Central Europe. The Shakers themselves came from Manchester, England, where they were accused of promulgating witchcraft. There were all kinds of stories, some homegrown, some imported from Europe, where various people came who were considered religious outliers, outsiders, remnants of the occult experimentation of the Renaissance and found safe harbor in the United States or in the early colonies. Freemasonry itself, I think, attained its zenith of influence among some of the American founders for whom fraternal ties were a vital and intimate part of life. This was an extraordinarily rural place. You had very few hospitals, you had very few universities, you had very few cathedrals, you had very few teaching facilities. There was church, there was commerce, and there was very little else. So when someone made the decision to belong to a fraternal order, they were making an art arterial decision in their lives. It wasn't casual. You weren't joining the raccoon lodge. It was a lifelong commitment. Uh, figures like Franklin and Washington were Freemasons as a lifelong commitment. There's all this talk today of the Illuminati, the Illuminati. What is the Illuminati? The Illuminati was a radical, renegade, Freemasonic group that was formed in Bavaria in 1776. No accident. Revolution was in the air. It existed for about eight or nine years before the Bavarian government harassed it out of existence. And it promulgated a radical expression of some of the occult civic ideals of Freemasonry, particularly the principle that the individual had a kind of cosmic right to his or her own esoteric search that was the property of no one else. Thomas Jefferson, who was not a Freemason, wrote admiringly in letters of the Illuminati, letters you can find in the Library of Congress. This is real history, not Alex Jones' fantasies. Real history, and it's there. There really is an occult history. So Manley's secret society thesis is not fanciful. It is misunderstood. It shouldn't be given over to mythology. Stories like the unknown speaker are parable, are myth. But like many parables in myth, they are vessels of truth. They are vessels of a greater truth, which is that there is an esoteric thread of influence that was felt very early on in our country's life. And if you want to witness it today, open your wallet, take out a dollar bill, and on the back of the dollar bill, you'll see the beautiful reverse of the Great Seal of America, the incomplete pyramid, and the eye of providence floating above it, surrounded by the Latin maxim, annuit septus noos ordo seclorum, which roughly speaking, can be translated as God smiles on our new order of the ages. That symbol is as old as the Republic itself. It goes back to 1781. It was commissioned by the Continental Congress. It did not appear on the back of our US dollar bill until 1935 when it was put there by Franklin Roosevelt, himself a Freemason, who was encouraged to put it there by his Secretary of Agriculture and later Vice President Henry Wallace, also a Freemason, a Theosophist, an actual member of the Theosophical Society with a professed interest in Buddhism, astrology, reincarnation, Native American mysticism. This is real history. There really is an occult history and it has been neglected and figures like Wallace and Roosevelt, for example, 
being Freemasons, were filled with a sense of portent at such an idealistic symbol. People talk about, use the phrase, a new order, as if it's something negative. It's not something negative, it's absolutely beautiful. The symbol that exists on the back of our dollar bill is the best of us, it's the best that we are. And the people who put it there, the Freemasonic founders, were influenced. It's not a symbol that's a direct leaf at a Freemasonry, but it's Masonic philosophy to the core. It extols the idea not only of the sanctity of the individual search, but it promulgates a notion that was very popular among some of the founders, particularly those who were Masons, which is that they wanted this new republic to be part of a chain of great civilizations that extolled wisdom and the esoteric search, including Egypt, Greece, Rome, and they saw that this new order of the ages as being the rebirth of a republic that would protect the individual search for meaning, which if America has greatness, that is its greatness. It's protection of the individual search for meaning. And when Wallace and Roosevelt decided to put that symbol, that Masonic influenced symbol on the back of our dollar bill, they were trying to reestablish a sense of connection to those early ideals. Henry Wallace talked about the need for a new deal of the ages, that was his phrase. So the fact is, this secret society thesis of Manley Hall's not only has historical validity, but it has been neglected. It has not been understood. He was correct in the broad strokes that there were esoteric ideals that were preserved within clandestine orders, including Freemasonry, including the Illuminati, including Rosicrucianism, that later found flowering and birth among some of the founders of this country who institutionalized some of those ideas. Have we failed to live up to them? Of course. Are there grotesque contradictions in the face of these things? Of course. But Masonic influence reached its zenith here. And Manley understood that at a time when people were apt to overlook that thesis. I've talked about his greatness. I've talked about some of his shortcomings. I alluded earlier to his work ethic. There was a tirelessness in how he pursued things. It, it, again, I, I, I must say, I, and I have explained, that there was also an unevenness, and that must be acknowledged if we're going to be accurate. But there was an industry, there was a tirelessness in terms of his output. And when it was at its peak of quality, it was extraordinary. And I think that it behooves us, especially those of us who want to write and express and speak and explore and produce art in the areas of the esoteric, to learn from that, to learn from that. We mustn't ever allow a laziness to creep in to our work. Now, you know, th there's someone here tonight to whom I want to pay tribute because I think that his writing has helped perpetuate this kind of industriousness that I encourage among people who explore esoteric or paranormal subjects. And uh, I'm very glad my friend is here tonight, and that is the writer Whitley Strieber, who is seated. Whitley, raise your hand so people can see you. Say hi to Whitley Strieber. And <laughs> I, I want to say a word of tribute to Whitley because it's very important that this be said, and I'm glad that we're recording this and this is going out over live stream. <sighs> Although Whitley's writing is, 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 is of a different kind 
than, than Manley Hall's historical writing, Whitley's memoir, Communion, in which he talks about his experience of what may have been alien abduction, is written with such impeccability that it's a book that I encourage every young person or not young person to read, or if you've already read it, to return to for an example of the kind of writing that we should be pursuing today. I think that one of the dangers that has crept into the field of esoteric historical writing and memoirs of anomalous experiences has been a tendency to get very cheap and loose with facts, to create composite characters, to repeat things without verifying them, to tell stories that are either somewhat juiced up or that maybe are several stories merged into one to heighten the sense of drama around them because the writer can always tell him or herself, well, there are so many wonderful things I've had to cut, somehow it should be permissible for me to bend the lines and blur the fabric of, of veracity in certain cases in order to get a larger point across. If you read Whitley's book, Communion, what you'll find as he writes about the really harrowing and occult events that befell him in the Hudson Valley region of New York State. He names names, he gives dates, he provides transcripts, he gives you addresses. And it's to me like drinking a fresh glass of spring water to encounter the work of a writer who records an anomalous and mysterious set of circumstances and gives you enough names, dates, locales, transcripts, quotes, and details so that if you want to, you can go and connect the dots yourself and arrive at your own takeaway as to the nature of the story. Read communion, read communion, because although Whitley wrote the book as a memoirist and not a historian, and it's of a different kind of writing than Manley Hall, it, it contains the best of what I think we should be aspiring to today in terms of documenting the unusual and the ineffable. We must never exaggerate, we must provide names, dates, quotes, and be accurate. And the reason for this is not just good literary citizenship, although it is. The reason for this is that you can't be trusted with ultimate questions of life until you can be trusted with the quotidian questions of life. Once you have your arms around that which is quotidian, conventional, and of day-to-day -day serviceability, then, then you can reliably address questions of the ineffable. And in communion, Whitley does both. Whitley does both. I would encourage everyone who has any aspirations towards self-expressiveness in areas of the anomalous to read that book and to learn its lessons. So, what was chapter three in Manley's life? Chapter one in his greatness was secret teachings. Chapter two, I think, was his writings on the esotericism of America, particularly as expressed in Secret Destiny and America's Assignment with Destiny. And there were lots of other essays, some of very good quality that we include in Secret History of America. There were decades ahead of him, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 